So with this, another warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us um, from your diverse locations. Um, my name is uh, Uta Steiger. I direct the European Institute at UCL and it is really my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you to tonight's event and to welcome our wonderful panel um, to tonight's event. Um, I will leave it to Alessia later on to introduce them individually. Uh, we're really uh, very glad to be partnering tonight with UCL's School of Slavonic and East European Studies, CIS. And I would be amiss if I didn't encourage you to um, follow also their CIS Now event series, which has a, a huge range of dedicated and very interesting events, um, many of them to do with Ukraine and um, the Russian invasion um, and uh, surrounding considerations. Um, let me also refer to you while I'm, I'm at it to uh, the European Institute's outputs um, around Europe, including uh, the current uh, war, um, among others on the UCL Europe blog, um, which we curate and which we seek uh, to bring together academic voices from across disciplines, as well as uh, voices from the field to investigate and explore um, a variety of issues as they pertain to Europe. Now, um, tonight's event, it's one obviously in the in a series of um what should i say events conversations debates we'll all be engaging with um that looks at um recent events since february's so the um russian federation invading ukraine um all of us have engaged in various ways in the multiplicity of debates surrounding this event but in particular today, what we would like to explore um, with our panelists is the role uh, Europe broadly conceived has played so far and what uh, Ukraine um, and its current crisis might uh, hold and stop for the future um, of Europe, including specifically um, the European uh, Union. Obviously, the profound implications of the war um, and, and its, uh, the suffering its causes is something that we I uh, don't know yet um, uh, how they're going to end, how, uh, what repercussions they bring for European society, for our security and integration um, going forward. Um, also for universities themselves, this has been quite um, uh, the time to try and rally our support as best we can. And at UCL, we have tried to um, create a number of support schemes, including a fellowship scheme which we run together with the Council of At-Risk Academics in order to support um, Ukrainian academics displaced by the war. Um, but for uh, tonight's uh, panel, I could really not think of any better um, constellation of people to guide us through what uh, we might learn from the crisis, what we need to understand from um, its uh, developments. And I'm really privileged um, to be introducing the chair, um, Olesia Kromechuk, who will be introducing the rest of the speakers. But let me just very briefly um, refer you to Olesia, who is the director of the Ukrainian Institute in London and an alumna from UCL. She has a PhD in history, uh, which she gained with us. And her, she is a historian of 20th century East and Central Europe particularly specializing in Ukrainian history. And she has previously taught at King's University of East Anglia, um, Cambridge, as well as at UCL. And she also runs a theater company, Molodiev Theatre in London, with stages documentary pieces that explore very urgent social and political themes. Alessia is originally from Lviv, but moved to the UK in 2000, since when she's been very actively engaged in the life um, of Ukrainians living in the capital. She's published a range of books, which I um, encourage you to, to look up. But for today, I'm just very pleased that you've agreed to join us, Alessia, and I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for introducing me. Thank you for organizing this um, discussion. Welcome, everyone, to, to this panel discussion organized by UCL European Institute and the UCL School of Slavonic and East European Studies. Um, my name is Olesa Khromychuk, and I'm the director of the Ukrainian Institute. It's, it's an honor for me to, to chair this discussion today. Just to remind you, um, this webinar is being recorded. Um, so today we have a really excellent panel of speakers uh, who will consider the implications of Russia's war in Ukraine for the future of European society, 
European security and integration. And we will hear from all of the speakers to start with, and then we'll have a Q&A session afterwards, a discussion. So please do submit your questions through the Q&A function um, via Zoom, and we'll try and voice uh, as many of them as we can in the course of the discussion. So let me introduce the panel of speakers um, in the order that they will speak. Uh, we'll start with Andrew Wilson, who is Professor in Ukrainian Studies at University College London and Senior Policy Fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Um, Andrew's book, Ukraine Crisis, What the West Needs to Know, uh, was published by Yale in October 2014. Um, and um, he has worked extensively on the comparative politics of um, Europe since 1990. Uh, his other books include Belarus, The Last European Dictatorship, published in 2011, and The Ukrainian's Unexpected Nation, which was published in 2009 and um, has been used as a textbook uh, when whatever Ukrainian studies are taught all over the world. Um, next, we'll have Sir David Liddington, who served in the House of Commons for nearly 28 years, including more than nine years as minister in, gov in the governments led by David Cameron and Theresa May. He was Minister for Europe at the Foreign Office, Leader of the House of Commons, Justice Secretary and Minister for the Cabinet Office, in which role he was also Deputy to um, Prime Minister Theresa May. He was a member of the UK's National Security Council and has represented the UK um, at the EU, NATO, uh, the UN Security Council and other international gatherings. Uh, David is now Chair of the Royal United uh, Services Institute, RUSI. Um, David will be followed by Georgina Wright, who is Senior Fellow and Director of Institute Montaigne um, Europe Program. She is also a Visiting Fellow at the German Marshall Fund um, of the United States and Senior Fellow at the Center for Britain and Europe at the University of Surrey. Uh, before joining Institute Montaigne, um, she was Senior Researcher at the Institute for Government, uh, in 2019-2020 and research associate at Chatham House between 2014 and 2018. Um, she has also worked for the European Commission and NATO in Brussels. And we'll also hear from Rosa Balfour, who is director of Carnegie Europe. Her fields of expertise include European politics, institutions, and foreign and security policy. And her current research focuses on the relationship between domestic politics and Europe's global role. She has researched and published widely for academia, think tanks, and the international press on issues relating to European politics and international relations, especially on the Mediterranean region, Eastern Europe and the Balkans, EU enlargement, um, international support for civil society and human rights and democracy. Rosa Balfour uh, is also a member of the steering committee of women in international security Brussels and an associate fellow at LSE Ideas. In 2018 and 2019, she was awarded a fellowship on the Europe's Futures Program at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Uh, since 2021, she is also an honorary patron of the University Association for Contemporary European Studies. So a truly excellent panel for this discussion. And I will begin by asking each of you um, to offer your reflections on where we are at the moment, uh, on Europe's response to Russia's war in Ukraine, um, how appropriate or not appropriate in your view it's been, um, what we've learned uh, from the last two months, and uh, also what we've learned from the last eight years, because of course this war did not begin two months ago, it started in 2014. Um, but also if you could maybe perhaps look um, to, to, to the future and offer some reflections on the, on the prospects as you see them. So these are all very broad themes, but you all have very unique expertise and we are really looking forward to hearing your insights. Andrew, let's begin with you. Uh, thank you, Alessia. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, well, in what sense is this a war about Europe? Um, well, I think we can start by saying clearly not what was on the agenda six months ago, NATO enlargement, uh, a European security treaty. I think this is much more clearly now a war about and against Ukraine, uh, a war of open recolonization. I'm very glad I used that term in an article about Crimea a year ago. And denazification. It was very easy to uh, mock when Russia used this absurd term as casus belli um, 
in February against a Jewish president who lost a great grandfather and three of uh, great grandfather's brothers in the Holocaust. But I think what's really scary is that within Russian discourse, this term actually makes some sense. Russia is a propaganda state. The way in which that state works is that there is a, a virtual chorus, chorus that reliably chimes the president's key words. So we should very much take seriously Putin's original history essay, uh, now widely known from last year, but also what the, what the chorus has been saying recently. Um, so according to pre former President Medvedev, Ukraine, mentally transformed into the Third Reich, will suffer its own fate. That was on April the 5th. And there's this now notorious piece on RIA, Novosti by Timothy Sergeyev, uh, what to do about Ukraine. And I'll quote this at length. Um, a total lustration must be conducted. All organizations involved in Nazi actions must be eliminated and prohibited. The further denazification of the bulk of the population will take the form of re-education through ideological repression of Nazi paradigms. Denazification will inevitably include de-Ukrainianization, the rejection of the large-scale artificial inflation of the ethnic component in the self-identification of the population in historical Malorossia and Novorossia territories, meaning those people in the east and south of Ukraine who think they are Ukrainian. Uh, more sagates it. Ukrainian is an artificial anti Russian construct that has no civilizational substance of its own. It is a subordinate element of an extraneous and alien civilization, which means Europe. Um, uh, uh, da -da -da -da. Uh, yes, sorry. So the collective West is in itself the architect, source, and sponsor of Ukrainian Nazism. Okay, so within this discourse, <laughs> uh, the meaning of Nazism means identifying as Ukrainian, uh, rejecting uh, the Russian view that uh, Ukrainians don't really exist, and it means being European. Um, a kind of crazy inversion of, our, uh, of the reality of the term. Um, this has all been just dating for a long time, in plain sight, on Russian TV for eight years now. Uh, so has what you might call Russian omnigression. Uh, apparently, we are now at war with the whole world, according to Major General Rustam Menakayev. But certainly, that means Europe uh, and America. We're not, and that should govern Europe's response. Um, we do have a dilemma in calibrating the need to arm Ukraine, uh, and we've done a lot better in the last two weeks in terms of giving Ukraine uh, the bigger and better weaponry than it needs, whilst at the same time not making this kind of crazy fantasy war in Putin's head into a real war, i.e. the rush. Russia versus the West. Um, and I think we, we are getting that balance better. But we're not saying, really, why? Um, and the answer, I think, is four things to remember from when modern Europe was founded back in the 1950s. Firstly, it was, it was obviously founded on uh, the need to overcome sublimate war. But back in the 50s, uh, in an environment where we understood that war, war is a reality and can still be necessary. And most European societies now take for granted the absence of war um, without understanding it, uh, the causes um, and the occasional need to fight wars. Ukraine is very much old Europe, fighting a defensive war, even with some martial pride, uh, which we've long forgotten. Thirdly, less explicitly, um, uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, the other thing was, was supposed to be never again was genocide. And as well as uh, absurd reference to and um, redefinition of the, the meaning of Nazi, uh, 
the kind of propaganda I, I quoted at the start is openly genocidal. It's talking about uh, removing, uh, re-educating uh, whole populations. Uh, Sir Gateshead also talks of so-called Catholic Ukraine. He rather loftily says its borders will be decided experimentally. Yeah, something will remain in the west of Ukraine, uh, but it will be, quote, artificially neutral and demilitarized. And that is where all the haters of Russia will go. Um, though at the moment, the main um, direction of uh, forced population movements is, is to Russia. Yeah, a million, according to Ukrainian sources, Ukrainians have been removed this kind of forcible re-education already. Fourth thing in the 50s and the 60s is to remember that the EU was founded uh, to uh, bind together former imperial powers in a post-imperial project. Britain, um, Germany, France, Holland, but never Russia. Russia is the last European empire and in many ways the most important empire because it was always an empire uh, on the European continent. For sure, it was always a complicated empire with its own uh, unique features. Academics talk of its internal colonization, for example. Uh, it never treated its own population particularly well. Uh, but from academic post-colonial studies, we, uh, are, we apply the principle of the, it's up to former colonies, the previously subaltern, to define empire as they wish. And to Ukrainians, this is both genocidal and uh, a re-imperialization uh, attempt uh, against them. Though we should also know that Russia benefits from asymmetrical geopolitics. The rest of the world is not behaving uh, in the same way. Uh, if it was, um, Georgia might be attempting a war of reconquest of its own territory right now. Um, other extremely weak fallen colonies um, in Central Asia uh, and elsewhere uh, would be rearming themselves to defend themselves if Russia is not disabled. So this is a war, an existential war of a colony against uh, a former empire. Um, the most dangerous word I would argue right now is off-ramp. We hear about that way too much. That implies Russia stops or withdraws, but with forces and threat intact only until next time. Uh, Russia, I would argue, should be defeated uh, in order for Ukraine uh, to survive uh, and Europe to revisit the agenda that founded the EU in the 1950s. Um, unfortunately, we still tend to think in extremely bureaucratic terms. Um, Ukraine, along with Georgia and Moldova, have applied uh, for formal membership. Probably, sadly and inevitably, that will be met with the, with, with the usual EU talk about the Copenhagen criteria. Uh, sort of kicking that can down the road. Um, but in terms of the existential reasons why Europe was founded way back in the 50s, uh, there should be an open door for Ukraine. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we will move on to David straight away and we'll take some questions later. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Alyssa. Um, well, I, I very much agreed with um, pretty much everything that Andrew said in his analysis, but let, let me add a few thoughts of my, my own. I mean, I think looking at where we are today, I'm very clear about what the objective of democratic Europe and of the Atlantic Alliance as a whole should be, and that is that Russia must lose. I think anything less from that will be a defeat, a strategic defeat for the democratic world. Putin is testing and will continue to test until he suffers a reverse and a defeat. Um, certainly, um, Andrew was right in attributing this most recent act of aggression by Russia to sort of dreams of uh, reconstructing its empire, 
Uh, I mean, this, this frankly racist nonsense about Ukraine not being a proper nation in its own right um, uh, indicates, I think, the state of mind of some of the people at the top of the, the Kremlin, and particularly Putin himself. The complaint that uh, this is really all provoked by the expansion of NATO um, is demonstrably untrue, given that uh, the NATO-Russia founding act um, recognized um, the uh, uh, bound party to accept the borders of Europe as they existed after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Uh, Russia uh, accepted a treaty obligation under the, Bel the Budapest Memorandum to respect the independence, territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. And of course, its invasion of Ukraine in 2014 and the annexation of Crimea and the occupation of parts of Donetsk and Luhansk in that year happened at a time when Ukraine was a neutral state before the uh, constitutional uh, aspiration to join NATO had been devised. We are now also seeing the mass uh, transportation, there's no other word for it, uh, of Ukrainian citizens from Russian occupied areas to places in what, what I think is best described as a, a, a 21st century version of the Gulag. So I don't think that there is any option for us than to continue with the hard line that all of the democratic allies have adopted. I don't see that for the foreseeable future, there is any prospect of a compromise becoming available, which is acceptable to both Putin and to President Zelensky. Um, Putin, I don't think, can uh, concede um, a return to the line of contact um, uh, before his uh, aggression of earlier this year. Um, and I don't think that after revelation of the atrocities that have taken place in different parts of Ukraine during this war, uh, that President Zelensky can accept or that or that his people would allow him to accept any outcome which in effect uh, accepted the continued occupation by uh, Russia of Ukrainian territory and therefore leaving fellow citizens of Ukraine uh, victims to this uh, sustained um, uh, sort of persecution and tyranny that, that, that Putin is imposing upon those areas where he has seized control already. So I am deeply gloomy about the immediate prospects, even if uh, Putin were to make some advances in the Donbass and then uh, hold a pause and declare some kind of victory. I do not for a moment believe that that would be stable. I think that the, uh, there will be an expectation in Kiev that the West will continue to arm uh, Ukraine. Uh, there would be a resistance that the Ukrainian government would promote within the occupied territories. And I, I think the Russians would only see such a, an outcome as a temporary measure before they sought to put the Kremlin's real ambition of trying to uh, reassert effective control uh, over the whole of uh, Ukrainian territory, turn the whole of Ukraine into a sort of vassal state in the way that they have succeeded with Belarus. Now, um, I think that um, Putin, Putin's mind, it seems to me that he believes he can outlast the patience of the West. He believes, I think correctly, given a uh, history of the last um, century, that the Russian people have a very high pain threshold. Um, and he is, of course, uh, using his control of the media to um, try to foster support for his own perverted vision of the causes of this conflict. He believes that the West will lack the patience, will, will not persevere with the either the solidarity or the practical measures that Western allies have taken. And, and if you look at what happened after 2008 of the invasion of Georgia and 2014, after the last um, incursion and occupation of parts of Ukraine, um, you could understand why Putin believes that. He will look to exploit any differences he can spot between Western allies. He will hope for um, President Trump to be re-elected re in 2024 and hope that that might shift US policy 
he will look to make trouble elsewhere. Moldova strikes me as particularly vulnerable at the moment, but possibly Georgia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, where the Russians have been uh, supporting Dodik's um, push to uh, weaken the uh, the, the Bosnia Herzegovina central state institutions, perhaps even in other parts of the Western Balkans as well. And we cannot rule out that um, Russia will use chemical, radiological, or tactical nuclear weapons as part of this conflict. Uh, the use of tactical nuclear weapons is openly provided for in Russian military doctrine, uh, and um, chemical weapons we have seen used by um, Putin's um, sort of dependent um, Assad in Syria, and of course we have had in the UK both a radiological attack with the murder of Alexander Litvinenko and a chemical weapons attack took taking place in Salisbury only a few years back, leading to the death of a completely innocent British citizen there. Now, what are the lessons for the West? It, and, and what have we learned from our experience of the last few weeks? First of all, I think that um, Washington has realized, if it had been in any doubt, that European security still matters and European security and peace cannot simply be left for granted. And I think that the European allies have realized that United States leadership remains critically important to the security of our continent. I think that we have seen uh, greater determination and solidarity within NATO uh, than at any time in, in recent years. And a lot of the criticisms of NATO have been silenced, I think, in the last few weeks. At the same time, we've seen better EU-NATO relations with uh, the EU institutional leaders and Secretary General Stoltenberg um, meeting and talking frequently. We've seen a dramatic shift in German policy, and we might go on later to consider whether there's a gap between the, the promise and the, the delivery so far, but, but there's no doubt in my mind Chancellor Schultz's um, speech to the Bundestag was, was epoch-making in how it ditched um, decades of uh, assumptions about uh, Germany's defense and foreign policy posture and, and the assumptions of uh, the chancellors and political party in particular. We have Sweden and Finland now likely to seek to join NATO within weeks or months. We have the Irish foreign minister uh, publicly questioning what Irish neutrality actually means in today's Europe. We have the United Kingdom post-Brexit, demonstrably still a serious player in European security. And Boris Johnson having to talk to Macron, Schultz, von der Leyen and others, and they having to talk to him much more frequently and intensively than at any time since uh, he took office and certainly since Brexit happened, which I believe is, is an essential sort of precondition for trying to rebuild a relationship of trust, which I think the security of Europe as a whole desperately needs. And that, of course, on top of the work that's been going on um, between the UK and the other members of the Joint Expeditionary Force. So what now? Um, first of all, I don't expect there to be a deliberate um, direct conflict between NATO and Russia. Uh, unless uh, Putin oversteps the mark and tries to test the will of NATO by uh, entering or striking at NATO territory directly and deliberately. I've been struck by President Biden's comments that he's, whenever he has talked about um, the United States not getting involved in fighting Russia uh, within Ukraine, he has coupled that with saying that the United States will, of course, defend every square inch of NATO territory. And I think that's a very clear message of hands off places like um, uh, uh, Eastern Latvia or, or um, parts of Estonia that might otherwise be at risk. Secondly, I think that um, all of us in democratic Europe need to continue to deliver arms, materiel and training to the Euro Ukrainian forces to enable them to resist as best they can. And I think that we can develop further 
the mechanisms for cooperation between European countries to make sure that we are as effective together as we possibly can be. Third, I think we're going to need to continue with the sanctions, and I think those sanctions are going to have to continue um, indefinitely. Um, and if Russia were to use chemical, radiological or nuclear weapons, then I certainly would expect and hope for the uh, West reactions to be to be to um, strengthen those sanctions still further. There are still missing elements, as we all know. Not every Russian bank of financial institution has been excluded from SWIFT. Um, for, for reasons we understand, um, there's, a, there's a reluctance to, uh, to, to uh, accelerate um, the, the European dependence upon Russian energy supplies. I mean, it's good that there's a plan to phase it out, and I completely understand why it is very difficult for some countries to do that quickly. But I think if Russia were to use weapons of mass destruction, I think that would change the picture. Um, and I think we need to continue to collect evidence of war crimes and crimes against humanity. What may, of course, happen is if there, uh, there were a Russian resort to uh, chemical or particularly tactical nuclear weapons, is the United States might consider using secondary sanctions of the kind that it has deployed against Iran, forcing companies, in effect, to choose between their interests in Russia and their interests in operating and trading within United States jurisdiction. And that would probably bring about the, the almost complete isolation of the Russian economy from the Western world. I, and I do think that that is something that Biden will come under very acute pressure to do from Republicans and Democrats alike, were Russia to cross that particular threshold. But I think in the long run, we in the West have to be prepared psychologically for a prolonged second Cold War. I simply do not believe after what has now happened and in particular after the mass slaughter of civilians, that we can contemplate a return to normal, uh, to anything like the status quo ante, as long as Vladimir Putin or a disciple of his is in power in the Kremlin. And that is, that is unwelcome. We all had different and better hopes for the relationship with Russia, but I frankly do not see those hopes as plausible after what has happened in the last six weeks. Finally, on European security, I think that there are two tasks. The first is to keep persuading the people of the United States and their representatives that European security matters to the US, that it should be considered a core national interest of the American people. I mean, we criticize President Trump, and I certainly criticized President Trump uh, in the past, but the thing about Trump is he does and did represent a significant strand of US public opinion that felt that for far too long European countries had been freeloading on the back of the American taxpayer. And I think that we're going to need to demonstrate in the future that we as European allies are both paying our fair share, but also exercising greater political leadership particularly in those parts of the world which the United States will not consider core priorities. So certainly parts of Eastern Europe, Western Balkans, um, Africa, parts that part, some Middle Eastern countries. Um, I think Europe is going to have to step up and take the lead more. And that's something that we've, we've, see, we've seen a shift in expectations in the United States, certainly since President Obama's time, which has been continued uh, by both Trump and by um, President Biden. And that leads me finally to the what new structures do we need for European security post Brexit? I've never believed that uh, you can talk um, sensibly about a European pillar of the Atlantic Alliance or a European security capability unless you have both France and the United Kingdom involved. I hope that Germany is going to fully accept its responsibilities as a major European power by uh, showing uh, a, a more forward-leaning policy on security. And I think that is something that we shall have to see as time goes on. But we have to, to deal with this 
in a context where some countries in democratic Europe will be in the European Union, some will be outside, some will be in NATO, some will be outside, where we somehow need to find a place, a European offer to Moldova, to, I hope, a free Ukraine, to uh, the Western Balkans countries at a time when the you know, EU electorates and EU governments are pretty much exhausted with the idea of further enlargement. Does this, for example, take us back to some of the ideas that President Macron has voted in the past about a Europe of circles or about a European Security Council that would enable European allies to act, perhaps drawing on NATO and or EU uh, resources? Um, at a time when there was a security challenge that were out, was outside the NATO remit, or which, which, where the United States decided that it did not wish to become involved or take a leadership role. So I think major challenges for us in the future, but I hope that if there's any, any re, sort of thin reassurance to be taken from this horrendous crisis uh, and, and now humanitarian catastrophe as well, that it will mean that it will mean that European democracies become aware that we cannot take our way of life, our values, um, our peace for granted, and that we show the resolution that we did for most of the uh, post-war period in defending those those values uh, and and that security uh, in the interest of our citizens, including the citizens of those uh, developing democracies in Eastern Europe and the Western Balkans, who are not looking to Russia for their model, but are looking rather in our direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, so we can now move on to Georgina. Thank you, Alicia. Um, and thank you to UCL European Institute and CIS for the invitation. It's, it's lovely to be back in the UK virtually, if from, if from Paris. Um, of course, the problem going after Andrew and Sir David is that they perfectly, you know, set out the problems, how Russia sees things, and then, of course, Sir David with numerous proposals. So I'm, I, it's, it's, you know, all the best things have been said. Um, so I'm going to sort of uh, rejig my presentation slightly and focus instead on, on France, more specifically, because as most people on this call will be aware, um, Emmanuel Macron has been re-elected, uh, and this will have implications, I think, on what France does next. Uh, on the war in Ukraine. Um, so I think it's quite important to be uh, to remind ourselves what France's approach was prior to the invasion uh, of Ukraine. And I think it, it rested on four pillars. One was um, dissuasion, so through sanctions, there was really this, this sense that sanctions would deter Russia. Uh, from invading. Uh, the second was um, public support for ongoing dialogue, so Russia-US talks, gosh, they seem ages ago, but they were happening. Um, the talks within the OSCE, um, talks within NATO, uh, and of course, support to any bilateral visits to Kiev and, and to Moscow. The third was uh, political and military support to Ukraine. And the fourth was reinforce NATO's presence. So there was this promise to have more French troops in Romania, for example, uh, but also talk about EU defense. So what has changed uh, since Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine? Well, the sanctions are now no longer to, uh, to, to deter, but very much to punish uh, Russia. And of course, there is a realization that the sanctions don't go far enough and that they haven't been sufficient. Um, and I suspect um, Rose is going to, you know, touch on this, but I think we've seen incredible um, EU unity on sanctions, but it's going to be tested now because the decisions of what, you know, future sanction package and what future sanctions can look like, as Sir David highlighted, are, it's tricky and it's going to impact some member states more than others. But, you know, sanctions to punish... Uh, to uh, support ongoing dialogue, including, um, of course, uh, Emmanuel Macron's uh, uh, talks with Vladimir Putin. And that's something that the French society as a whole supports. So they see uh, the French president's ongoing talks with, with Vladimir Putin as important. The third is po political military support to Ukraine, yes, but also humanitarian and financial assistance. Um, and finally, much more active within NATO and, and, and on EU defence. And I think there was, 
in Paris at the time, we heard um, the sense of somber determination, which, um, you know, in typical sort of French drama, but I think kind of really captures the mood around the time of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which was A, this realization that we can't act without US leadership, um, and that, you know, commercial tools um, or trade tools aren't enough to exert pressure. Uh, and that actually, uh, you know, we need much more uh, to deter uh, Russia and also to respond to Russian aggression. Um, and then there was this realization that France got its initial reading wrong. I mean, if you remember uh, when the US and the UK were saying, we think a, a Russian invasion is, is imminent and poses a great threat, you, Germany and France um, said, well, we, we don't have the same intelligence. And so there was this open public acknowledgement that they got their reading wrong. So this somber determination led to what we're calling a, a geopolitical awakening for the EU, which of course, a France under Macron uh, supports. Um, the realization that the EU needed to be in a position to act or Europe needed to be in position to act. So there's you know, NATO, but also uh, the EU filling the gaps. Uh, so on investment in particular, we could come back to that in the Q&A if that's um, helpful. Um, the realization that the EU where it could act, acted really forcefully. Uh, so on sanctions, for example, though, again, as I said before, the realization that the, the, the unity on sanctions might be tested um, now. Um, and also thirdly, I think, which sometimes goes, um, you know, we take it for granted, but actually the EU unity can work. And there are, and you hear in Paris a lot of times, the three big moments of EU unity. Uh, so on COVID uh, with the response, uh, particularly in the form of this mass investment plan uh, on Brexit and now on, on Ukraine. And the question is, will they be able to continue that? Um, and of course, beyond the EU's response, which France supports, France has also given 420 million euros to uh, in human and uh, humanitarian and military assistance to Ukraine. Uh, and the 420, there's 100 million in the form of military uh, weaponry, so uh, missiles and, and cannons. Um, so what has France's reaction been beyond the, the, the kind of support? Um, so as I said, initial skepticism that Russia would actually uh, invade. Um, but all of the uh, candidates who were running in the election did condemn Russia's invasion. Um, though not all of them have supported Macron's response. And this is where it's quite, uh, it's quite interesting. So if you look at Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who's the uh, hard left candidate, and Marine Le Pen, who was the far right, one of the far right's candidates, they said, you know, of course, uh, I, I mean, Marine Le Pen put it uh, quite interestingly, she said, of course, you know, I support unconditionally Ukraine because I believe in sovereignty, uh, but I also don't believe in, in the delivery of arms to Ukraine, though in the great, the grand débat, so that debate where she faced uh, Emmanuel Macron, she did actually reverse that and said, no, I do believe in, in, in military support to Ukraine. Um, and, and most, I think, French people are against any further enlargement, um, which also could be a, a problem if we do consider, uh, you know, think about Ukraine ever joining the EU and sort of the, 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 the blocks there. Well, the councils, the grouping of EU 20, you know, the 27 member states would have to unanimously agree to accession, but it also might go to a referendum in France. Uh, and at the moment, uh, the French are not really in favour a further enlargement. But the question then is, what's the alternative? And that's where this idea of con you know, concentric circles and other forms of association, uh, um, I think will be explored, uh, especially now that we know who's going to be uh, in the Elysee for the next five years. So finally, what's, what next? Um, I think France will obviously continue to fully support uh, the EU um, and continue to be active in NATO. And I suspect actually, uh, that France will one day, you know, we, we hear more and more this discussions of the European pillar of NATO, and I suspect France will want to be at the heart of those discussions. Uh, you can expect a lot more on EU defence, but when you look at what that means in practice, still big disagreements there. And so at the moment, we're still at the rhetoric, but I, but I suspect France will push to go further and faster on that as well. And finally, on sanctions, I mean, the French president always visits the German chancellor. That's always his first uh, state visit uh, once, uh, once they are elected. And I think uh, further sanctions and particularly 
um, how to stop imports of Russian fossil fuels will be high on their agenda. Um, and then, you know, who knows, potentially a joint visit to Kiev uh, to show support to, to the Ukrainians. But there are many more things we can we can go into, but I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Georgina. So, Rosa, please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be in this uh, group. I'm actually in London at the moment, so not in Brussels, but I will be speaking with, you know, with a view from Brussels, because I think a lot has been said. I agree with most of what has been said already, so I'll try to sort of give the, the view from the EU um, in the hope to add a little bit more analysis. But what I'd like to do, um, Olesia, is actually start from a question that you asked at the very beginning. Um, to what extent was the, con the conflict foreseeable? And you tied it, obviously, to the annexation of Crimea 2014. And I would say, let's start with Georgia 2008. And I think um, in most European capitals, the realization that 2008, 2014 and 2022 are actually an escalation of the same goal. Um, I think this, uh, you know, Russia's um, goal, I think that realization did not come before the 24th of February. And uh, Georgina rightly pointed out to French and German intelligence as to what Russia was doing. I mean, there was incredulity in these European capitals that this, it was actually uh, Putin's goal. Um, and so I think, you know, in light of this, we need to, we need to understand the response also in light, in light of the, this um, um, cloudy uh, view of uh, Putin's intentions prior to um, the 24th of February, um, 2022. Um, and so the response um, was a dramatic shift, as um, Sir David was saying earlier. Um, and I think the question really is to what extent this shift will last and how deep it will go. Uh, Georgina rightly pointed out to the uh, French presidential elections, Macron won, but of course many voted for Marine Le Pen, whose uh, policy on Russia is uh, incompatible uh, with the West's policy towards Russia at the moment. Um, we will have elections in Italy in one year's time, roundabout, um, and there are pockets, um, still pockets of public opinion um, that, that, that view um, the, the current uh, war uh, very much through Russian lens. And this is playing out also in Germany at the moment, and it's playing out in the um, SPD in the party of the Chancellor. And so even though we have seen uh, an unprecedented united response, um, it is still is something that I think needs to be um, measured against time and the degree to which this response will hold. And it, it, it really it is on the um, lives of Ukrainians that this will play out essentially. Um, if um, if uh, Russia were to, which it, it, it appears not in its present intention, to um, you know halt um, and uh, negotiate some kind of deal with Ukraine, and this really is very unlikely at this this moment in time for both sides. Um, I think in Europe there would be a lot of opinion in favour of some kind of ceasefire, which would not solve the problem if we accept that Putin's goal is actually to destroy Ukraine and to upend European security. So we're in a bit of a catch-22 situation from this point of view, and it's being played out on the lives of um, Ukrainians. Um, so so in, in the European context, the degree to which domestic politics will shape foreign policy is still important, and we need to watch that space uh, precisely because of these pockets and, uh, and the electoral cycles, et cetera. Um, having said all this, the response has been remarkable and unprecedented, and it's a whole set of package, a package. and I'll, I'll just list the areas uh, rather than go into any depth, I don't think we need to in this context, but we, we've had five packages of sanctions which have been carefully crafted and prepared with the support of the Americans as well, unprecedented transatlantic cooperation on this front, and of course also with the UK, at last, uh, they started talking again, the UK and the EU on foreign policy matters. Um, 
commitments on security and defense, uh, budgets, spending, plans, um, also in supporting Ukraine, not all member states are doing, not all EU member states are doing it, but some are doing this. Um, unprecedented uh, solidarity with U Ukrainian refugees. Um, alas, it is just the Ukrainian refugees. It doesn't really change the, um, doesn't necessarily change the um, refugee policy and doesn't necessarily um, alter the um, the problems that the EU had back in 2015, 2016, when it was uh, Syrian and, and Afghan uh, refugees, but nonetheless, this is happening. Um, extraordinary economic and financial support um, to Ukraine. And of course, perhaps the most significant and far reaching um, response with, with respect to energy diversification, this will have a long-term impact um, in weaning Europe off uh, Russian fossil fuels and potentially, if it's played out well, also um, at um, accelerating the green energy transition. So the responses are, uh, you know, massive, um, uh, massive, wide, unprecedented and negotiated together with the closest uh, partners of Europe, um, the US, the UK, etc. And I think they do reveal um, quite an extraordinary might in terms of economic statecraft. And this is something which I think will remain for the long term. This is where Europe's strengths actually are. And this is where uh, Europe will profit some lessons and benefit um, from what it has managed uh, to mobilize. Uh, the other thing I'd like to uh, refer to is the enlargement question. This has been, in fact, all, all speakers have referred to it. I think it's um, critical that Europe, the EU, European member states respond um, very positively um, to this demand for accession, um, especially given that uh, Ukraine itself has you know, been willing to rule out uh, NATO membership, which is what it had um, aspired to um, until very recently. Mm, the type of response, this, this will be tricky as Georgina was mentioning, um, but it, it, I do think, um, as Sir David was also saying, it does um, add new um, uh, arguments in favor of Macron's proposal for, you know, be it a differentiated a sort of wider uh, European Union with different types of association. There's several ideas circulating on this on this front, um, and I would be um, so long as the war continues. Longer the war continues, I think the more uh, these ideas will continue circulating, and the more compelling they will become. It will be harder for European capitals to keep these countries out but we do have the starting point has to be in june with north macedonia and albania which need to get green lights towards um negotiating starting to open starting negotiating accession with the eu but i think not now not with the present commissioner but perhaps in the next commission with a new commissioner uh, working on enlargement um, and what is now called enlargement and neighborhood policy um there'll be ways to be creative so that we can um, associate uh, the three countries that have just applied, that are just in the process of submitting their applications, um, more creative ways to keep them engaged and to keep that dialogue um, moving. So, so that um, is, is critical. Um, is all this enough? I think this is another question, um, Olesia, that you raised. Is all this enough? And I think what's interesting is that only yesterday, or to, to, in today's news, did we actually get an idea of where, what the end goal of the West actually is? Um, this had not been clear uh, because nobody wants to talk about regime change. Nobody wants to even mention the word. And um, if uh, Putin or, or Russians thought that the West was aiming for, game, uh, for, uh, for regime change, it would have been highly detrimental to the West's policy. So this has been you know, brushed under the carpet. This is not what the West is about. But finally, yesterday, following the visit um, of the um, of um, uh, Blinken um, to um, Ukraine, it was clear. And I think this is a very um, it's, it's a clear objective that can be uh, shared 
by European governments as well. The goal is to make sure that Russia will not be able to militarily attack again further. And so whether it is um, Donbass or whether it is uh, just Donetsk and Luhansk, whether it is Crimea or not, um, that is down to Ukrainians, to be perfectly honest, to, 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 you know, to, 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 to say what it is they're willing to um, accept and what not. But the key point is that it has to end there, because what we've seen 2004, 2014, 2022 has just been an expansion of those goals. It's, you know, the, the times in between need to be interpreted as timing for preparation, not as, you know, uh, Putin suddenly woke up one day and decided that he actually quite fancied uh, the Donbass. So, so um, th the goal has to be to make sure that uh, Russia is no longer uh, capable uh, of attacking um, uh, Ukraine, Moldova, or anywhere else for that matter. And that is a military goal, uh, but it's also a goal that can be achieved uh, through the sanctions. And I think there still is room for um, um, and, and a further uh, sanctions package, which is being discussed. It was put on hold somewhat, but now like, it's likely to be um, rediscussed here in Brussels on an oil embargo. There's the problem of, of Germany um, and Germany doesn't, and German chancellor doesn't seem to be preparing the German public um, towards uh, bearing the costs um, of, of an oil embargo, but um, um, you know, it's, it's being discussed. And, um, and sanctions are not just, uh, you know, the, at this point, they should not just be interpreted as punitive tools or as tools to signal the West's disagreement with Russian actions in, in Ukraine. They need to be interpreted as undermining the capacity of the uh, Russian, of, of the regime uh, to attack further beyond outside um, its borders. The, and I think this is important to clarify that this is the end goal. Um, and then in parallel, just going back and here, you know, I, I, I refer really to the work of my colleagues and the work of other authors who are experts on Russia. Um, it's going to be very difficult to engage with Russia even after Putin. Um, it's going to be increased. It's, it's becoming the, the more the war is prolonged. Um, the more tensions, um, right, the confrontation rises, um, it, the more the harder it, it is. And we need to prepare for a Russia that could implode. We need to, at the moment, uh, the, you know, the, the, the goal of the regime is to turn it clearly into a totalitarian state. At least this is what my colleagues from Carnegie Russia are writing. Um, and there is a risk that um, Russia might implode, and we don't know along what lines, um, but the possibility of a sort of democratization of Russia, which has been really the sort of idea at the back of the, uh, of the minds of, of the West since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, since the end of the Cold War, this seems to be um, quite remote. So, um, you know, uh, as, alongside being clear about what the aims of uh, West's policy, uh, what the aims are, I think we also need to think about um, what to do with post-Putin uh, Russia and how to engage with Russians and not least uh, Ukrainian-Russian reconciliation, which is, you know, I, I mean, I realize I'm being a bit futuristic here. It's very hard to imagine these days, but eventually it will have to be, um, I think it will have to be addressed. I'll end here for now. There's plenty more I could say, but. I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you all for your uh, contributions. Uh, I'm sure you all also, you know, um, trying to respond to each other, but we only have half an hour and we have a lot of questions and I will refer to those questions both submitted before the event and what we've received in Q&A function um, now. But I will just begin with one question that I am really curious to hear from you an answer to and and that's you know you've you've mentioned i think most of you have mentioned that there was no clear realization of what putin's actual end goals were until two months ago not necessarily in ukraine i would say i mean i think it was pretty clear for ukrainians since 2014 that the destruction of statehood in one form or another or another was definitely um uh, a name of putin's um of putin's russia 
And we, we've also seen uh, skepticism uh, in Europe in relation to how long Ukrainians can last um, once Russia did attack, um, you know, something between three hours and three days, right? And we've been proved wrong. And the sort of the, the, the other branch of the skepticism was this uh, absolute surprise at defiance and resilience that Ukrainians have shown, which I think is also a sign of ignorance um, of Europe, you know, not realizing that, of course, Ukrainians will um, stand up defiant because they know exactly what Russian occupation means uh, because they've experienced it for eight years in Crimea and parts of Donbass and therefore they will not be prepared to experience it anywhere else uh, in uh, Ukraine. So really Ukrainians have found themselves in this kind of curse of Cassandra of knowing the future but not being listened to. Um, I suppose the question I'm asking you is um, is Europe and the collective West listening to the knowledge coming out of Ukraine now for, for you know, in, in, in a more meaningful way than it did before? And as David said, that European security is, um, it needs to be made more clear that European security is not national interest uh, of the American people. Well, what about the realization of Europeans and Brits, I include in, in the European community, whether they understand that Ukrainian security is part of national interests for uh, Western Europeans? So this is a kind of twofold question, but, but it's really uh, related to the same issues. Um, it's to all of you, so please uh, do choose who would like to answer it. Just unmute yourselves, please. I can see that. Yeah, Andrew, please. Well, there was a, also a question in the uh, chat uh, about why there are no Ukrainian experts on the panel. <laughs> um, I've been channeling some of them, both in my initial remarks uh, and in other events. Um, but I definitely think um, the West doesn't listen enough. Uh, although Ukrainians have done a much better job at uh, explaining their positions highly articulately uh, and in much better English than was the case 10, 20 years ago. Um, but there is West planning uh, and there is still a failure to recognize Ukrainian subjectivity uh, and to put overall Western interests in front of Ukraine's. Right? To still, still talk about the dangers of being dragged into further war um, for Germany, openly to say that a 2% hit to its GDP is not worth paying. Um, and also to, although recognize uh, the fighting capacity of the Ukrainian army, still not give it proper credit. Uh, this is hugely and mainly morale. Um, the importance of fighting for your own country um, uh, and not fighting for uh, distorted propaganda, unreality. Um, but it's also horizontal resistance and uh, help to the army, civil society support, better leadership, not just Zelensky, but the army uh, has been much better led than Russia's. Um, and I don't think we recognize that still. We still keep Ukraine, expecting Ukraine to collapse under heavy Russian onslaught. Um, Russia keeps showing its inferior morale uh, uh, and military organization at every step. Um, the whole point of the recent, recent Donbass offensive was to try and disguise that, minimize casualties, um, uh, prioritize artillery, and keep, keep really bad Russian troops away from the front line. Um, but they've still run into many of the same problems. Um, unfortunately, it has, a, has the paradox of tempting Putin towards these um, chemical and other weapons, precisely because his um, conventional forces um, perform so well. So I don't think we've done well enough in terms of giving Ukraine proper voice, uh, in term of, terms of putting their voice uh, at the top of the agenda, um, and even uh, uh, properly analysing what's happening on the ground. Thank you, Andrew. Hey, Brett, shall I go come on, I'll listen just a I think in terms of, you know, looking back, what did we collectively get wrong about this. I think this probably was an assumption that Russia would be guided by a sort of rational self-interest and that as long as Ukraine was fairly weak, divided, a lot of sort of corrupt oligarch influence on the politics of Ukraine, um, and that there was an unresolved conflict in the East that um, meant that 
you know, frankly, NATO, you know, Russia knew NATO and EU membership was not actually going to happen for many, many years, if at all, because until that conflict had been sorted out, one wouldn't know the territory that, that one was giving membership to and support to. But then th I think things have changed. I think that um, part of it may be Putin personally. You know, there's everybody who's been, who's been watching him and watching Russia closely says that, you know, he said the last two years pretty much in isolation from anybody else. He seems genuinely to believe these fantasies that um, Ukrainians, particularly Russian-speaking Ukrainians, are Russians really and are just longing to return to uh, the, the 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 Russian family. Um, I think Zelensky demonstrated that he was not willing to be a Russian patsy, and I think that possibly came as something of a shock to uh, the Kremlin. And then they looked at the state of the West. They saw a chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, and anyway, it's certainly a strategic defeat for the West. They've seen Brexit and you know, I, I had my, my very strong views, but uh, basically a continuing, continuing quarrel and friction between London and key EU members. Uh, they've seen President Macron in a difficult re-election battle. They've seen an a new, untested German coalition coming into office. So the West was looking pretty febrile. And I think if you're Putin, you look back at 2008 and 2014, I think one could say that the sanctions packages then were not um, strong enough, but also that they were relaxed far too soon. And I can remember sitting in the Foreign Affairs Council you know, as soon after the annexation of Crimea as 2015, and you know, having some of my colleagues around the table arguing that uh, the sanctions should not be fully renewed when they came up for their 12 monthly reassessment and renewal, and they should be diluted in some, in some way. And I say that was within a year. Of uh, of Crimea being an X, so I, I I think that, and I think this this uh, aggression has been a, a real wake up call to the West. I just hope that those those lessons are learned and sustained. Thank you. Anyone else, Rosa? Yeah. Um. Very quickly. Um. Yes. No. I do think the understanding of uh, Ukrainian history is limited in uh, much of Europe. Um, and I think also there are quite a few, again, pockets, but not, not uninfluential pockets who actually think Ukraine doesn't, doesn't exist historically as a nation, as a people. Um, so there's a lot more explaining that needs to be done. But I also think that it should not just be on the basis of fraternal solidarity that Europe should mobilize. There's also the principle um, that you cannot um, invade a country or do land grabs or undermine the sovereignty of, of another country. And that's what, that's what the whole post-World War II order was built upon. And so it's not just that we need to mobilize because um, Ukraine is European, but it's because Russia has broken certain fundamental norms um, that, that uh, are required for peaceful order. And so there are two reasons, but I'm not, what I'm not seeing necessarily everywhere, the same sort of mobilization, um, uh, rhetorical mobilization um, in favor, both of Ukrainians and of uh, principles um, on part of our governments. And that's why I was voicing some words of um, caution um, and, um, you know, um, earlier when I was talking about, um, you know, how long will Europeans endure, especially if you have a chancellor who's, you know, worried about the impact of an oil embargo on the country's GDP. Uh, you know, this is the one of the wealthiest countries in the world. So, um, you know, maybe it's a price that is worth paying. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, I saw you, you had your hand up. Did you want to add something? Oh, um. There are plenty of other questions, but um, when uh, David Livingston was talking about things we got wrong, uh, I think there's one thing that we got right, even spectacularly right, uh, which is um, a totally different uh, approach to Russian uh, myth-making and disinformation. 
Uh, I think there are many reasons why we um, uh, released such high quality intelligence, but foremost amongst them was uh, a strategy to prevent Russia creating a cover story, a narrative for its invasion uh, by putting all of our information out in the public arena. Um, and I think that worked very, very well. I mean, the main thing that undermined any Russian cover story was invasion. <laughs> It'd be very difficult to construct another narrative once that happened. Um, but um, uh, this kind of unprecedented release of high quality intelligence helps as well. Great, thank you. Um, so um, moving on to the questions, uh, hoping to cover at least some of them. So you've all mentioned the EU integration and expansion and um, also the perhaps surprising to at least Putin unity um, to some degree, although there's still difference of opinion. There's a really good question which is asking whether the EU has to undergo a deep rethinking of itself, its values and perhaps even restructuring. And will it not cease to be attractive to many participating countries otherwise? So, you know, we're, we're, we're prepared prepared to assume again that most of the countries that wanted to join still do want to join but of course let's not forget that joke that appeared in Ukraine about NATO that you know NATO can apply to join Ukraine after a couple of weeks of, of Ukrainian resistance so um, yeah anybody wants to take that maybe Georgina you would like to start? Yeah I mean that's you know that would be kind of preaching to, to, to Macron because he, he would love that question and he would respond by saying well, for the first five years, that's what I've been saying, right? I've been saying we need to reform the EU because it doesn't meet uh, the uh, expectations, nor is it responding to the concerns of French, uh, well, European, French and European citizens. And we need to reform it and we need to reform it on all sorts of things. And then he'll kind of roll out the 60 proposals he set out in his Sorbonne speech. So, I mean, that is, you know, in, in Paris, they, they would really agree with that. But I think the question, so I'm, I'm turning it in jest, which I shouldn't, because obviously this is a you know, this is a really serious situation. And I think this is a really good question because beyond the rhetoric, what does that mean in practice? And that's where sometimes Macron, uh, you know, gets under other EU leaders' skin, which is it's great to put forward all these proposals, um, but we need to make sure that there is a, you know, sufficient deliberation and that actually these reforms are going to be supported by our publics. Because a lot of them, if you, if you look at... Um, even there was this, you know, conference on the future of, of Europe, which some people may have heard of now. It wasn't the grand democratic exercise that Macron was hoping for, but they had sort of, I think, 400 to, uh, you know, maybe more like 200,000 people participate. So it's like, you know, nowhere near the 400 plus million uh, Europeans, but who pitched in um, proposals for the future of the EU. And actually, if you look at many of them, even those who say, I want, you know, I don't want the EU, I don't want institutions determining what happens in my country. If you look at their proposals, the answer really lies in more Europe, uh, often, not, not less. But it's not because the solution is more Europe that it will be readily accepted. And so I think, uh, and this is where the question is interesting, is yes, the EU needs to reform, it needs to reform on all sorts of fronts, but do we have public buy-in and support for those reforms? And that's much harder to achieve. And I think, um, in a sense, uh, the EU knows it has to change because otherwise it will potentially lose even more support and, you know, who knows, potentially lead to, to further weakening and, and, and fragmentation in the long term. And I think that political buy-in is going to be essential. Great. Thank you. Um, another question from a member of the audience. Um, I'm quoting, it is no longer a secret that European and Russian businesses, um, sorry, European and Russian business politics and charity are closely connected with each other by Russian money. In your opinion, what role did the corruption of European politicians, hidden or more obvious, and private interests play in allowing the situation to happen? Can Europe do something about this now, or is it fraught with internal instability. David, may I ask you to comment? Uh, we've heard the nickname of London grad many times. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, and I think they, there are, there, there are um, criticisms that can be made of, of that. Um, but I, I think that um, there's no evidence that I've seen that um, suggests that there's been a practical impact on policy. I mean, the Rus Russia, Putin have certainly tried to influenced the UK and we know that we know that there, there, there have been Russian bots and other the disinformation exercises, you know, RTs being used as a propaganda channel. Um, but our rules on political funding are 
pretty strict and that you know, it's simply unlawful to accept a donation from a from a foreign national uh, except a sort of Irish or Commonwealth resi you know, resident in, in, in the country on eligible to vote in the UK. So, you know, the idea that uh, sort of Russia can simply sort of by uh, sort of influence British policy. I, I don't generally don't think having been in cabinet, having been in government for nearly 10 years, I, I just didn't see that happening at all. They never they never bothered with me <laughs> anyway. Um, and the our independent electoral commission um, you know, said that um, they found no evidence of that in uh, general elections or in in the Brexit referendum, a lot of allegations. And, you know, as somebody who strongly supported Remain, um, you know, I might be the first one to to sort of demand a, a, a recount in those circumstances. But you, know, you can't um, put down um, sort of millions of people voting with a pencil in a polling booth and say that that's due to, to Russian propaganda or, or Russian money. So, yeah, we've got to be on our guard against it. Um, and we probably should have been more on our guard in the past than uh, we we have been. I mean, Cameron made an effort when he had the presidency of the G7 to get uh, sort of global agreement on this. So one would deal not only with the the various sort of UK um, British overseas territory tax shelters, but you know, with the state of Delaware, with, um, with some of the arrangements in other parts of Europe as well. Um, and I still think in practical deliverable terms, that is probably the most effective way to go about this. But yeah, we all have to learn from 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 this experience. Thank you. Anyone else wishes to comment on that? No, Andrew? Well, I just uh, list several French companies that Macron will have to uh, ask questions about in his second term. Um, Total, obviously, in energy. Um, but most importantly, uh, excuse my French, Thales, um, uh, who have been supplying um, the Russian military, um, including um, thermal imaging uh, used in um, uh, various um, war crimes. Um, that, that will be an ongoing scandal. Thank you. Um, another question from uh, an audience member submitted before this discussion, and it goes as follows. Can Ukraine combine a possible future neutral status with sufficient military capacity to deter further Russian aggression? So Ukrainian neutrality is being discussed and has been discussed uh, for some time. And Yaroslav Hrtsak, Ukrainian historian, recently gave an interview, which I thought was very compelling, where he says that most countries do not choose to be neutral. The circumstances force them to be neutral, and when they have a chance not to be, um, they won't be. So, um, yeah, any thoughts on on that? Andrew, maybe you could start again. Okay. Um, there are many types of neutrality, and Ukraine has zero interest in Russia's um, proposed uh, non-bloc, non-military form of neutrality. Um, that's an absolute non-starter in the current circumstances. There are forms of heavily armed neutrality where uh, neutrality is guaranteed by other states. Uh, that was why we technically went to war in 1914 uh, over Belgium, um, uh, because uh, we guaranteed its neutrality. Um, if forms of security assurance can be allied to neutrality uh, or some kind of um, highly militarized, but uh, regionally supported non-bloc or new bloc kind of status. There's plenty of room for creative thinking there. Um, but the forms of um, guarantee that Ukraine is talking about uh, almost amount to Article 5 kind of strength, um, in which case, why not join NATO? <laughs> um, that, that is the most difficult part in that kind of creative thinking getting close to Article 5 without actually being uh, in NATO. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, th I think there's, I mean, there are obvious challenges about, about the sort of security guarantees, but not NATO membership that, that Zelensky has been talking about. I mean, frankly, I, I cannot see um, that European security guarantees would be sufficient for Ukraine. Um, you know, even if both the European nuclear powers were, were part of that, I, I think probably unless the US 
willing to act as a guarantor for Ukraine. And that again also raises questions about stationing of forces, tripwire arrangements and so on. Then um, I can't see the UK and France on, on, on their own or with other European partners being, being sufficient there. Um, it's one of the reasons why I'm just pessimistic about the idea that there's some, some compromise, which only if we look hard enough, we can, we can identify. I mean, actually, would just say, if I may, um, uh, Alessia, in, 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 in passing, just I think one of the consequences of this crisis is that nuclear proliferation globally is now more likely, because I think a lot of countries are going to look at what's happened to Ukraine and say that's what happens when you choose to give up your, your nuclear weapons. So I think that's, a, that's another really bad outcome of this, this uh, crisis. Indeed. Can I quickly add, Alicia, because I think um, David is absolutely right, and I hope that this gives France and the UK, uh, uh, you know, one area where they could uh, come together and think constructively about about nuclear proliferation and all the rest of it. Um, but I also think it's about nuclear power, um, and you know, uh, we know that France and Germany see <laughs> they see things very differently, um, and about uh, but nuclear plants being such. So vital um, in French energy provisions. So I think it, it extends. It's beyond the simple kind of defence, you know, nuclear weapons. It's also about uh, nuclear energy, and I think that's going to be a, a key debate as well. Thank you. Another question. I'll try and slip in another two questions. Hopefully, we'll be able to answer in the remaining time. Um, so, a question from a member of the audience: What do you consider the likelihood of uh, significant civil and social unrest, and even more in Western? Balkans and um, can Serbia really be considered as a potential EU member in view of its stance on Russia? We haven't heard from Rosa for a while. Rosa, would you like to start? Yeah, no, I mean, this is something, this responds very much to something I've been thinking about um, with, you know, we've had just had presidential elections in France and Macron was re-elected. So one risk has been uh, postponed for to five, to five years time. Uh, but um, on 3rd of April, both uh, Viktor Orban and, um, and Vucic the, uh, were re-elected respectively in Hungary and in Serbia, and they both are quite openly pro-Russian. And one is, of course, a member of the European Union and causes a lot of trouble um, in undermining unity um, among the EU member states, less so within NATO, but definitely in Brussels, in, in the EU. Um, irregularly is, is uh, you know, undermines unity, tries to block, even, even banal declarations are blocked by Hungary. And of course, Serbia is uh, in accession talks to join the EU, very far from joining. And we know the enlargement process has been in, in a long period of crisis and stalemate. But nonetheless, uh, Vucic has, um, you know, once re-elected has confirmed that they're not going to follow EU policy, despite the fact that if you're a candidate country, you're supposed to align your foreign policy positions to those of the EU. Um, and so I, it, it's got me wondering as to in, you know, this sort of post uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine world, whether the EU can actually um, continue having such uh, disruptive elements within and whether we should start thinking about a foreign policy of a fewer because there's a debate on qualified majority voting which I think is very institutional and it doesn't it's not going to solve the problem I think the problem is how to circumvent um, and uh, you know member states that ostracize continuously ostracize and um, common positions um, when clearly the European interest is, is there I mean in this case there's no doubt about where the European interest is um, so yes, so that is a problem. Um, but um, or, I mean, both of course, Vucic and Orban have consolidated their positions in power. Uh, the opposition to these um, uh, political party, to these to these political forces, have not managed to um, vote them out democratically. Um, so this is a problem, and it's a problem that runs parallel to the erosion of democracy in both these countries. So we need to see it also, you know, and Europe's strength has to be tied to its dem democratic strength. Um, so th th this is this is a challenge. This is a big problem. I won't give answers now, but it's a big problem and something that needs to be monitored carefully. 
Thank you. And I'd like to end uh, by taking us beyond Europe, because, of course, Russia's war in Ukraine has uh, uh, implications for the entire world and well uh, in particular with food shortages that we're likely to experience and already beginning to experience. And one of the questions that was submitted beforehand was how can we get more support from China, India, and other countries against this war? Um, and we, I'm afraid we need very brief answers because we do need to wrap up. Brief answers to a very complicated question. I'll have a go and give a highly insufficient answer, which is it's going to be very difficult. Um, I don't think, uh, you know, China prides itself not being aligned uh, on things. And so taking a position in this, uh, it will be very difficult to get, you know, to make China budge. And, and um, the Institute where I work, they, they published a really interesting brief looking at how Chinese media was covering the war uh, in Ukraine. And most of it was sort of initial surprise that, that you know, that Russia hadn't managed, you know, how could their military get it so wrong? But there was this real sense of not taking a position, uh, continuing to emphasize uh, diplomacy, but it's not our role to have a say, uh, and also trying to see it from both angles. So I think, I think it's going to be very difficult and equally uh, with India. So I, I you know, I, I wish I had a, a solution. I wish I could say, oh, well, talks, you know, let's just continue talking. But I, I've become a little bit um, skeptical and, slight, and slightly cynical on the potential. Any other thoughts? Very brief thoughts. I think uh, Georgina's right. The, I mean, uh, Xi um, has made his mind up, and you know, his long to longer term, he can see this is going to make Russia more dependent on China. Um, you know, and it's a long way away. We know what what's the gain to him by siding with the West? Um, Modi, Russia is his um, by far his biggest uh, supplier of arms and defence equipment. I mean, the test for India is not over the immediate crisis. It's much further down the line that as Russia becomes more dependent on China, at what point does India start to worry that their their biggest defence supplier is falling under the influence of their big strategic adversary? Well, thank you all, and my apologies to all of you who submitted really excellent questions, but we simply didn't have the time to raise them. Um, the speakers could see them uh, all and hopefully will address them elsewhere. And I thank all the speakers for sharing their uh, insights, Andrew, Georgina, David, um, and Rosa. And uh, I pass on to um, the mic, the virtual mic over to Uta again. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Before, before you all log off, can I really just um, say a massive word of thanks in particular to Alessia, um, who's done wonderful chairing today. Um, and I do note um, that although um, today's panel was really focused on Europe and what we wanted to do was to bring, you know, put Europe on the spot. And that was one of the reasons why we put the panel together the way we did. Um, I, she has given a fantastic keynote the other day um, for the British Association for Slavonic and East European Studies, where she actually pointed out that sort of West's blaming attitude, amongst other reasons, sometimes also within the community. The title, the talk is entitled, Where is Ukraine on the Mental Map of the Academic Community? And I'm going to put this in the chat, the YouTube channeling of it, so that you can see it for yourself. Um, I also want to thank um, all the panelists from our end from the European Institute and from CIS. And I particularly also want to thank uh, Lucy Shackleton, who is Head of Public Policies and Partnerships at UCL uh, at the Institute and has um, been the brains and the driving force behind this. So a big thank you um, to everyone and um, a note also that the recording will be made available um, um, shortly. So thank you very much.